Okay, so uh, Adimantus finishes his speech. Uh, Socrates says that he's sort of uh, amazed that these two brothers, uh, that, 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 that they're not unjust, that they can argue so well against justice, they can argue so well in favor of, of injustice, and yet they themselves are not, or are not unjust. He says, I, I, I trust you because I know you, I know what you're like, I know that you're not actually unjust uh, people. But he says, if I didn't know you, I would, I would not trust you at all because you argue so well in favor of injustice. And he says, I, I don't know what to do. On the one hand, uh, I, I feel as if I, I, I don't really have anything to, anything to say. I, I don't know how to respond to these criticisms. And yet I feel like it, he says it would be impious, actually, to just sit here and, and listen to injustice being denounced like this, being uh, uh, criticized and so on, and not say anything in, in response, not try to defend it. So he says, I didn't know what to do. And then suddenly he says something occurred to me, and he, he suggests that, you know, if, if we were having trouble, he says, we're, we're not clever, we're not sharp-sighted. So if we were trying to read writing and we were having trouble reading it because it was so small uh, wouldn't it be easier if, if we could find the, the the same writing somewhere larger and then we could read it in this in this very big form and then uh, come back to the to, to the smaller form having seen it larger it'd be easier to make out the the, the smaller print wouldn't it and Annie Mantis says yes it would uh, what do you see in in, in, in this case that, that resembles that other one at all <laughs> how is that relevant and Socrates suggests this idea that well the city is big, and there's justice of a city and justice of a human being, justice of, of the city and justice of the individual. So if we can find justice in the city, maybe we'll be able to, to see it more clearly in the human being. If we can figure out these things about justice in the city, then maybe we'll be able to figure them out more easily in the case of the individual. Uh, and, and therefore, maybe we should start by looking at a city and trying to find justice there. And they all agree, but this is obviously very questionable for a few reasons. First of all, the idea that, that, that the, the city is just a giant human being, or conversely, that, that the individual is just a small version of a city. Obviously, there you can make an analogy. Obviously, there are comparisons. But uh, is there really enough similarity that it makes sense that, 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 that it's like a large and small version of, of writing of, of the same word or something? Uh, I mean, you could argue that, but it's certainly, it, it's not self-evident that, that there's that much similarity between the city and the individual, that justice in one will simply be justice in the other. And if you can find justice in the city, it will be, then, then you can just turn around and find the same thing in the individual. Though this is essentially what Socrates ends up doing, saying that justice in the city is, is, is the proper relation among the, uh, the uh, different classes in the city, and justice in the individual is the proper relation among the different parts of the soul. Um, but, but in any case, you know, questionable. And then, of course, also, since part of the problem seems to be that they still haven't actually established a definition for justice, they still don't know what justice is, the problem doesn't seem to be that, that the writing is too small for them to make out. It seems to be that they just don't know what justice is. So it's not clear how looking at it uh, uh, at, at the level of the city will somehow make it, make it more apparent to them or make it easier for them to see. But no one really makes these objections. They agree, so they start to found this city. And, so and since Adimantus has started speaking, the, the conversation begins between Socrates and Adimantus. And Socrates says, it, it seems to me that a city comes into being because none of us are, are self-sufficient. Uh, or, or do you think there's any other reason, he asks Adimantus. Uh, as he says at uh, 369b, uh, a city, as I believe, comes into being uh, because each of us isn't self-sufficient, but is in need of much. Do you believe there's another beginning to the founding of a city? None at all, he said. Now, obviously, he'd come back and say, yes, mutual defense. Uh, a city begins because there's there, 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 are, there are either enemies, other human beings, or just wild animals for, for one reason or another. Maybe we band together for mutual defense. Maybe that's the foundation of a city. But Adiantus, as we saw in his speech, compared to Glaucon, certainly uh, not nearly as focused on violence and things like that. So he did, it doesn't really occur to him. He says, no, that's why. It's, it, it's mutual need. None of us is self-sufficient, so we all come together. So Socrates says, okay, let's look at the most basic city then. Obviously, the most pressing thing would be food, so we would need a, a farmer. And then after that, we would need clothing and shelter, and then maybe a shoemaker, somebody to... to deal with things concerning the body. He says that would be the most basic city, the most, the, the most basic, the most immediate needs, food, shelter, clothing, uh, shoes, you know, things dealing with the body. Uh, he says this, this would be the most basic city, a partnership of four or five people doing these very, very essential tasks. And then and Adimantus agrees, and Socrates okay, says, so, says, okay, when, how will it work? Will one person f do his own farming, uh, his own weaving, and his own uh, house building, and so on? Or will each one do one job? Of course, it's an odd question because the whole point of the city seemed to be that no one is self-sufficient. So if everybody just comes together but does all the work themselves, it's not really clear uh, you know, 
by their form in a city. It seems to go against what Socrates has just said, but in any case, he asks this question, and Anymantra says, well, maybe, probably it would be easier if, if each person were just doing one job. And Socrates agrees, and, and so, so this, this idea, which is very important to the city that they found in the Republic, in this very kind of nonchalant way, is, is kind of smuggled in here, the idea, the principle of one man, one job. And, but it's not just that it's easier, as Socrates says, it's also a question of some people are naturally suited to some jobs rather than others. So this city is also founded on natural aptitude. The, the, the reason that someone is a farmer and someone else is a weaver, according to this, is that, that, that it will be based on, on somebody's nature, on, on what they're naturally good for, what, what, what they're naturally good at, what they naturally have an aptitude for, what they naturally are drawn towards. So you know, it's, it's one man, one job, but it's also you know the individual is kind of matched up with the job that, that is best for their nature. Um, so so that's the sort of beginning to the city. Again, it's 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 uh, each person comes together, uh, each person is doing one job, uh, and, and they're all contributing to the city. Uh, and so that's that's that sort of uh, uh, basic uh, basic uh, foundation for the city, and it's founded on mutual need. Now uh, they go on then, and, and they sort of elaborate. Um, it is, you know, the, the first city is based on mutual physical need, therefore mutual natural need. It's hard to argue that food is a natural need, um, uh, you know, shelter as well. These things are basic, fundamental needs. Everybody needs, so they come together to cooperate as a partnership based on, on this. Uh, everybody produces something, everybody contributes to the city. Uh, and so then Socrates, though, goes on and they, they add all kinds of other, they say, well, you know, if we're going to have one man, one job, having established that, then Socrates says, well, in that case, you know, we, we need a blacksmith, for instance, someone to make the plows for the farmer. Because the farmer, if the farmer is going to do his one job and, and do it well, he says, you know, there, there, there's a crucial point in each job where something has to be done immediately. And, and, and when it's, when, if something is going to be done well, uh, the activity that's being done doesn't just wait for somebody to show up and do it. There, there's a particular time when it needs to be done. So he says everybody would do one job. And so, for instance, the farmer isn't going to make his own tools. We'll need a blacksmith that does that for him. And then he goes on, and it becomes quite elaborate. I mean, he, he says for all of the different people uh, making tools, there will be merchants of a certain sort, there will be all kinds of other things uh, in the city. And the city grows fairly large, but still relatively small and still relatively basic. And again, although it does grow up, the, the basic idea is that everything remains, uh, as, as we see especially in this, when, when Glaucon jumps in and, and, and they start to change the city, it becomes clear then especially that, that this city, everything is still based on, on basic fundamental necessity, on need. Th there are merchants because they have to trade with other cities. There, there's, there's even a currency. Socrates doesn't seem to think that that will create uh, greed or, or, or kind of a surplus economy by itself. Other thinkers have said once you have money, people start to hoard money because, because you can. You can't really hoard natural goods like fruit or meat. You know, they spoil money you can pile up forever, so acquisition is set loose when you have money. Not in this city. Th th there is money, there is currency, there's trade with other cities, but things are still relatively moderate and, and, and relatively kept within very particular bounds, as, as Socrates goes on to explain. So, so they found this city, uh, everyone has one job, it's, it's all basically everybody is doing something necessary, contributing to the city in common. Uh, and as Socrates says at 371e, where in it then would justice and injustice be? Along with which of the things we considered did they come into being? And Adimantus replies, I can't think, Socrates, unless it's somewhere in some need these men have of one another. And so Socrates says, well, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, it's actually, they're actually having trouble finding out what is justice unless, as Adimantus puts it, it's in some need that these men have of each other. Again, maybe it's the mutual need. Maybe justice comes from uh, the fact that they all need each other. And, and what's just is that everybody's contributing what they have and then you know, taking from the, from the rest of the city. And this mutual need makes for cooperation and makes for, for justice. And of course, there, there's very little in the way of injustice. Uh, it's hard to see where, where, where anybody is, is, is going to get the better of, to, to use Thrasymachus' phrase, it's very hard to see where anybody is getting the better of anybody else or how they would do that. Uh, again, justice in this case seems to, seems to work out. There seems to be a great deal of mutual cooperation. Very little about the law or, or about authorities or about police or anything like that. Uh, and, so, and yet they, they're having trouble figuring out, well, what is justice in this city? What does it mean? So Socrates goes on and he says, well, let's, let's consider the, the kind of life that they'll, that they'll lead. They'll, they'll farm and they'll, they'll have this very basic, he describes a very basic kind of uh, uh, way that they'll, that they'll kind of eat. And, and it's, very, it's all very simple. Um, uh, as he puts it, uh, 372b, for food they will prepare barley meal and wheat flour. They will cook it and knead it, setting out noble loaves of barley and wheat on some reeds or clean leaves. They will stretch out on rushes strewn with yew and myrtle and feast themselves and their children. 
Afterwards they will drink wine and, crowned with wreaths, sing of the gods. So they will have sweet intercourse with one another, and not produce children beyond their means, keeping an eye out against poverty or war. So, you know, even sexual intercourse is regulated in this community, taking, you know, again, as he puts it, keeping an eye out against poverty or war. So you don't want to have too many children because, because otherwise you, the city grows and either you'll have poverty or you'll have to go to war to get more. And as we might expect, Glaucon doesn't like this. From his speech, we know that he's very drawn to excess. He's very, he, he sort of, he, he isn't going to like this city at all. Adimantus likes it. It's very suited to him. Adimantus is very moderate. Glaucon, not moderate at all, very drawn to excess of, of, of almost any kind. And so here we see that they're regulating uh, uh, sexual activity. And on top of that, what they're worried about, too, is war. So, so no one is, no one is, is going, uh, is, is sort of uh, uh, being too excessive in, in, in terms of sexual pleasure. And no one is being excessive at all. In fact, people are, are trying to avoid war. They, they, they don't want any of, the, any of the violence that we saw so much of in Glaucon's speech. So Glaucon interrupted, saying, you seem to make these men have their feast without relishes. So at first he interrupts and says, you know, they, well, what, about, uh, what about relishes? Why is this such a simple meal? I mean, they're, they're, they're laying there on the ground, uh, you know, eating barley loaves. I mean, <laughs> why, why don't they have anything, you know, a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, appetizing or, or exciting? Although, again, you know, behind that seems to be a, just a general dissatisfaction. And so Socrates replies and says, What you say is true, I said. I forgot that they'll have relishes, too. It's plain they'll have salt, olives, cheese. Man, maybe not the most exciting relishes in the world, but then he says, well, salt, olives, cheese, better than nothing. And they will boil onions and greens, just as one gets them in the country. And to be sure, we'll set desserts before them, figs, pulse, and beans. And they'll roast myrtle berries and acorns before the fire and drink in measure along with it. And so they will live out their lives in peace with health, as is likely. And at last, dying as old men, they will hand down other similar lives to their offspring. So now finally he gets to the end, to, to, to the death of these people. And, and what do they really, what have they done? They've had a very simple, very, uh, very safe, uh, very moderate life. And they die, and, and what do they leave behind? Just, just more of the same, the, the same type of life for their children. And Glaucon interrupts, and he says, he says, If you were providing for a city of sows, Socrates, on what else would you fatten them than this? So Glaucon basically says, this is a city of pigs. These people aren't human beings. They're, they're more like pigs than they are like human beings. Uh, they're, 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 ta they're taken care of, basically. They have very simple needs met, uh, needs for food, needs for protection, need for shelter. But, th but they're not recognizably human in any way. Again, they're more like pigs who are just eating and, and, and just going off and living an animal existence of, of safety and contentment and so on. Uh, so he says, you know, this is a city of pigs. What else would you fatten them on? You know, again, he's sort of, th there has to be more than this, but he's kind of fumbling, not entirely sure what it is. He's sort of saying, you know, that there, there should be, you know, relishes. There, there should be this. And, well, how else should it be, Glaucon, I said? As is conventional, he said. I suppose men who aren't going to be wretched recline on couches and eat from tables and have relishes and desserts, just like men have now nowadays. So again, Glaucon says, you know, I'm not sort of laying on the ground and eating off of a leaf. They, you know, they, they have a couch and a table. I mean, you know, again, let's let's see them be kind of civilized and, and have a little bit more uh, to what they're doing, a little bit more, you know, pleasure and, and, and refinement and everything. But again, right now he's just focused on the food, uh, and so and so Socrates says, "All right," I said, "I understand." We are, as it seems, considering not only how a city, but also a luxurious city comes into being. So Socrates says, okay, so what you're saying is you want luxury. You want more than, you don't want what's simply necessary. You want luxury. You, you want things that aren't necessary, but are pleasant and, and the, that are desirable because of this pleasure, though again, they're not actually necessary. Uh, he says, perhaps that's not bad either. For in considering such a city too, we could probably see in what way justice and injustice naturally grow in cities. This is at uh, 372E. Uh, and so again, you know, he sort of acknowledges, you know, it's hard to find justice in that for a city. In this case, probably if we consider as he ca what he calls a, uh, what he eventually calls a, in a minute, a feverish city, a luxurious city, that's probably where we could see justice and injustice really come into being. That's where we could really see these things and identify them, which was the whole point of doing this. And, and so Socrates goes on, he says, now the true city is, in my opinion, the one we just described, a healthy city, as it were. So he says, this is the true city, this is the healthy city, the city that's based on, on, on necessary uh, mutual need. But if you want to, let's look at a feverish city, too. Now, you know, what does this mean? Why does he call this, this city uh, a true city? Um, it's uh, it's uh, uh, not always entirely clear what this means, but, you know, possible explanations. Uh, that this first city provides for the needs of the body, uh, which is the true purpose of the city. So Socrates or Plato could here be saying, you know, why do we really have cities? Ultimately, it's to provide for the body. It's, it's to keep us safe and alive. Therefore, this is the true city because it does what cities really exist to do. 
Um, it, it could be uh, the true city because its justice is, is rooted in mutual need, so therefore its justice is unproblematic. It's a true city because all cities claim to be based on justice, but this is the only city where that, where that really works, where its justice is really rooted in mutual natural need, and so there is no, there is no injustice. The justice is hard to find because it's so unproblematic. Uh, it, it could be, it, so these are different possibilities, obviously. Some of them are going to be mutually uh, exclusive. Another reason Socrates could say that is maybe it provides for true human needs. So it maybe not provide for all of them, uh, but it provides for true human needs. That, again, the need for food, the need for shelter. The fever city that they're about to create caters to all kinds of human needs that aren't really true. It, it, it caters to all kinds of needs that, that aren't true, that, that people don't really, it, it, it caters to all kinds of desires that are not things that people actually need. And some of them are simply uh, uh, illusions. It, it, it caters to desires for things that people think are good, but really aren't. Uh, and then finally, as, as, as the note suggests, uh, that Bloom, the translator, suggests in the note, maybe Socrates calls this the, the, the true city because it provides what it promises, material well-being, a kind of rational organization of the city. Uh, actual cities all claim to teach virtue. They, they, they claim to tell their citizens what it means to, to be a good person, and they try to educate their citizens of that. They, they try to make their citizens that type of person. But the, 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 the virtue, the justice that all cities teach, first of all, again, it's, it, it's not the same everywhere. And so, you know, the, 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 the virtue, the justice that actual cities teach is always incomplete. Uh, it's, it's always uh, partial. It's, it's always you know, not, really, uh, not, really, not really virtue the way that it claims to be. This city doesn't claim to do that, but, it is, but that makes it the true city because it's not making false, cr false claims. It's not making these great claims for itself that it's making its citizens into good human beings, that it's actually educating them to actual human virtue. It's just saying, look, it's, it's again, we're, we're keeping them safe. We're providing for basic physical needs. Maybe So again, maybe that's what Socrates means by calling it the true city. Maybe he just means that this is the city that, 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 that actually does what it promises. It, it, it provides what it promises for citizens. It doesn't claim to be making them virtuous. And then failing to do that in some way, it, it just it doesn't make that claim at all. Therefore, again, it's true. It, it actually it actually uh, lives up to what it's claiming to do. Um, in any case, uh, Socrates says this. He says that this is the true city, and he says, but you know, but but let's go ahead and then consider a feverish city. And he goes on. He says all kinds of things that that uh, that, that, that will need to be uh, added to the city. Uh, all kinds of. Uh, couches and so on, comfortable uh, furniture and so on, uh, all kinds of uh, fairly uh, luxurious foods, cakes, etc. Um, they actually have to add pigs to the city, so it's kind of ironic. Socrates or uh, Glaucon called the initial city the city of pigs, but it's actually there. There were no pigs in that city because you don't actually need pork to survive. It, it, it's it's not there. There are other things that you can eat. In fact, the people in the first city seemed like maybe they were even vegetarians. Uh, so so pigs weren't necessary. It's only in the second city that you actually have pigs because it's when you start to have luxury that, that, that as Socrates puts it, that's when you have need of that animal. So he focuses on all of these things, Socrates, that, that, that will be added to this, this luxurious city, this feverish city. And he really, again, as, as the suggestion is calling it a luxurious uh, city suggests, he really focuses on them as luxuries. So he does talk some about now we'll have, so I mean there, there's you know, stuff about makeup and fine clothes and jewelry, fine uh, precious metals, uh, gold, ivory, things like that. Again, things that only have conventional value, things that only have value because societies agree, let, let's treat this piece of rock as very valuable even though it doesn't have any real natural value. Um, but, you know, and so he goes on, and, and he also, he does add, well, then there will be rhapsodes, and there will be a certain amount of, of greater uh, cultural life, a certain amount of, of more advanced art and so on, but Socrates doesn't really focus on that. He really doesn't pre present this as a city uh, in which there will be a sort of a, a, a more, a sort of a more developed uh, uh, intellectual activity or more, more developed artistic activity. He doesn't really present the, the alternative as healthy, but... Uh, very basic and kind of uh, not not very well developed, uh, uh, not very interesting city, not culturally developed versus feverish but culturally developed. He really focuses much more on a basic uh, healthy city versus luxurious feverish city. So I mean, although he says there will be rhapsodes, there will be actors. Clearly, there's there's more cultural activity in this city. He doesn't really focus on that as either good or bad. What he really focuses on uh, is is again is is the actual luxuries. And then so he goes and he says, well, so we need a lot more doctors. Before, when everybody was just doing their job, staying active, eating very simple food, uh, drinking wine, but never in excess, uh, it was, it, we didn't need that many doctors. People were pretty healthy. In this city, we'll, we'll need a lot of doctors. 
because the way that people live will make them sick. And Glaucon says that's true. And then Socrates goes on and he says at uh, 373d, he says, uh, and the land, of course, which was then sufficient for feeding the men who, who were then, will now be small, although it was sufficient. Or how should we say it? Like that, he said. Then we must cut off a piece of our neighbor's land if we are going to have sufficient for pasture and tillage, and they in turn from ours, if they let themselves go to the unlimited acquisition of money, overstepping the boundary of the necessary. Quite necessarily, Socrates, he said. So Socrates is here, he's kind of pushing in a particular direction and giving Glaucon chances to say, well, now wait a minute, let's let's think about this. But So Socrates says, we'll have to take some of their land. Glaucon can say, well, now wait a minute, I wasn't thinking about that. But he does, he says, yeah, that's right, that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, so Socrates continues, after that, won't we go to war as a consequence, Glaucon? Or how will it be? Like that, he said. So again, he gives Glaucon the opportunity. I mean, Glaucon can answer in a lot of different ways here. Uh, he could, of course, say, you know, I, I didn't think about that, Socrates. You're right. Let's back up. Maybe, maybe couches aren't so important. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe they don't need all of. Maybe, maybe, maybe they don't need, uh, you know, pigs and uh, bacon and everything. Uh, maybe, maybe that's not worth going to war over. So he could just say, well, never mind then, let's let's back up and not have all of this stuff. I was irritated at first, but now that I see that this means war, let's go back to the original city. Um, or, of course, he could respond by saying, well, no, Socrates, we can trade with them. We, we don't have to have conflict. There are, there are all kinds of ways that we can uh, create a kind of harmonious uh, trading relation. So we don't, we don't need war. We don't need violence. Uh, we can do all kinds of things. But Glaucon agrees, yes, there will be war, and he doesn't, he doesn't blink, he doesn't hesitate, he's not at all worried about it. Uh, so he goes very quickly from being irritated that people don't have couches and, and, and relishes to now, well, then there's going to be war. People are going to have to fight and die over this and kill each other, and Glaucon is like, yes, exactly. So, I mean, clearly he has uh, what, what, what for, uh, here you know, we see Plato recognizing in Glaucon that, that at least in some people there's clearly present uh, what Freud would later call the death drive. I mean, Glaucon here, he's faced with the, with the, with the possibility of violence, destruction, death, and, and he doesn't back away at all. He's, he's just as comfortable with that, just as eager for that, it seems, as, as he was with, uh, as he was eager for, you know, couches and relishes and, and uh, everything else. Um, so Glaucon says, yes, there will be war, and Socrates says, continuing here at uh, 373e, and let's not yet say whether war works evil or good, I said. So Socrates says, let, let, let's not say yet whether war is, is good or bad. He says, but only this much, that we have in its turn found the origin of war, and those things whose presence in cities most of all produces evils both private and public. So he says, let's not say yet whether war is good or bad, whether it works good or evil, but he says, we found the origin of war, and where have we found it? In the, in the existence of luxuries, in the existence of things that people don't need, but for some reason desire and, and crave so much that they're willing to, to, to accept war as, as, you know, killing other people as, as, as and possibly dying, as the price for these things. He says, and, and he says, you know, we found the origin of war in those things whose presence in cities most of all produces evils, both public and private. So what most of all produces evils, both public, evil for the city, and also evils for, for privately, evils for the individuals, these luxuries, the, these unnecessarily things, the, the, these unnecessary things that people nevertheless desire intensely and, and that, you know, can actually work the destruction of individuals and even the destruction of cities. Socrates says, "This is this is the, this is where this, the, these are the things, these luxuries that most of all uh, uh, work evil, both again publicly and privately." And he says, "That's where war comes from." So then he says, "Well, now uh, we're talking about a, a much bigger city. Uh, the city's going to have to grow quite a bit because now we're going to need a, a, a class of warriors, people who who defend the city." And Glaucon says, "What? Aren't they sufficient themselves? I mean, this was this is the way that it worked in ancient Greece was that you know citizens were warriors." Uh, they, they were all members of the of the army and, or, or the navy in one way or another. They would, but they would participate directly in war. And Glaucon is kind of, well, what, can't these people defend themselves? What do you mean you need a class of, of mercenaries of, of of soldiers who will just only fight for the city? Why can't the citizens do it themselves? Uh, and Socrates says, Ah, you forgot one man, one job. Uh, if if something is going to be done well, the person has to devote themselves exclusively to that. And he says, well, is is shoemaking more important than war? Glaucon says, no, of course not. And, and you know, again, we see Glaucon uh, very kind of attracted to war in a way, respects war, respects the, the art of war, the, the art of uh, being able to fight well. And, and so he quickly agrees, yes, of course, you're right. Um, warriors, above all, will, will need to focus on one thing if they're really going to do it well. So you will have an independent class of warriors in this city. 
so again, war because so you start with luxury. Uh, a lot of people want luxurious things. They want more than just laying on the ground eating a loaf of bread. Uh, and so so they, they they want more things. And luxury then creates the need for expansion. Things that the, uh, the land that was sufficient when you had a very small city, um, you know, somewhat large, but still relatively small, focused simply on you know, genuine necessities, uh, obvious necessary needs, mutual cooperation among the people. Uh, there wasn't much there to steal, so no one had any particular reason. It, it, it wasn't a wealthy city, so no one had any particular reason to attack. Uh, and they didn't need that much from other people, so they had no reason to attack other people. So when you had that type of city, uh, there, there was uh, no war, but Glaucon didn't like it, so he said, I want more than that, I want, I want luxury, I want couches, etc. So you go from that, this desire for luxury, to, uh, to basically then needing to take more, and therefore needing to have war. So desire for luxury, therefore that, that, that leads to the necessity of, of, of violent conflict, of war with other cities. And therefore you need to have, according to this principle that they've established of one man, one job, therefore you need a, a particular a, a class of people who are only warriors. And again, remember, part of the idea of this, part of this principle of one man, one job was we will, we will uh, give people jobs that they're naturally suited for. So Socrates says, so therefore the warriors will be people who are naturally suited, well, obviously to being warriors. And so what type of person is that? Well, it, it obviously needs to be someone who uh, is willing to fight and kill other people. Obviously, th they need to be courageous, but there also needs to be a certain level of, you know, let's, let's just be honest, cruelty. They, they need to be willing to, to actually harm other people. And so Socrates says that there needs to be something kind of ferocious about them. How is, how is that going to work? How are we going to be able to have a, a group of people who are naturally suited to be warriors, who are naturally willing to fight and kill other people, and are ferocious enough and, and, and you know, basically violent enough to do that, and yet don't do that to, them, to, to each other and to the city? How are we going to have people who are, who are willing to fight and yet somehow do not fight each other and do not fight the city and, and do not tear up the city and, and attack their fellow citizens? How can we do that? Uh, how can we have a, a, a nature that, as he says, you know, it's sort of like a dog. We, we need someone who's, who's ferocious enough uh, but, but can also be gentle. We need that sort of, that, that, that sort of that, that, that mixture of qualities. And uh, Socrates says, well, how can we do that? And, and Socrates says, I, I don't think it's possible, is it? And Glaucon just kind of gives up and says, well, I'm afraid so. Uh, it looks like it. It looks like it's just not possible. Uh, and he says, ah, Socrates says, he was also at a loss. And then he says, oh, but wait, you know, what about we just said that, that these warriors have to be like dogs? And he says, and therefore that, that shows us, that shows us, therefore, that the warriors should be philosophers. That's, that's what's going on. And Glaucon says, um, sure I quite follow you. Uh, remember, philosophy had a kind of a bad reputation in ancient Greece. Socrates obviously was eventually put to death. Uh, we won't read these sections of the Republic later, but when Socrates suggests that uh, uh, philosophers should rule, uh, people say, well, you know, people are going to get angry at you. They might even attack you. This idea that philosophers who are often considered, you know, vicious or, or at worst, just kind of useless, the idea that they should rule, people will not like this at all. So when Socrates says, oh, yeah, clearly the, the warriors, they'll need to be philosophers. Glaucon is sort of mystified. What are you talking about? And Socrates says, well, you know, it's just like dogs, right? He says, have you ever noticed that dogs uh, are very angry at anybody they don't know? But they're very friendly to anybody they know. And he says, and that's even if they don't know somebody and they've never had a bad experience with them, they still bark, they still growl, uh, they're, they're still kind of, you know, fierce with them and, and threatening. Whereas with people they know, he says, even if they've never had a good experience, even if a you know, person doesn't feed them, never pets them, they're still happy when they see them. And Glaucon says, yeah, I never noticed that, but you're right. And Socrates says, ah, so wouldn't we say then that they're philosophic, that the dogs are like philosophers because they base whether or not they like something on whether or not it's familiar to them, whether it's not, whether or not it's something that they know. So again, now, now here the suggestion that, you know, philosophy in some way is, uh, is a matter of, uh, is, is a matter of, you know, the, the philosopher is someone who likes things that he knows and gets angry at things that he doesn't know. I mean, obviously not a very convincing picture of philosophy. Uh, Glaucon kind of accepts it, and it's hard to believe that Plato actually thinks that this is what philosophy is. It's just getting angry whenever you encounter something you don't know about. Uh, hard to believe that Socrates really means this is a serious definition. But, Glau but Glaucon agrees, and, and in this way then Socrates introduces this idea that the rulers, uh, the, 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 the warriors at least, the guardians as he calls them, and, and eventually the rulers will have to be philosophers then. That's the way to make them so that they can actually, uh, actually uh, uh, be, be the kind of warriors that they need, people who will fight threats to the city and be, be ferocious enough and, and, and be uh, uh, spirited enough to do that, but not actually turn against the city uh, and, and not actually bring that, be, 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 
be too violent or too warlike against each other and against the city as a whole. Socrates says, ah, if they're philosophers, that's what will make it happen. So Socrates says, so should we uh, educate, should we talk about how we will educate these people or not? And this is when Adiamantus breaks in again. Adiamantus was very concerned with, with education. He thought in many ways that was the really crucial question uh, for ancient Greece was how should we educate? How are we going to reform education so that we can get people to be just? And here Adiamantus jumps in and it begins a, a different kind of segment of, of the conversation. So, so what's going on here basically, obviously Adiamantus and Socrates found a city. It is if it's not just, it's only because it doesn't even need justice. So it's it's a city, again, Socrates calls it a true city. And, and what is what is the sort of larger significance of this? Again, clearly people like Glaucon exist. Uh, remember Adi Mantis, again, very happy with moderation, basically wanted justice to be uh, praised uh, in, in a very moderate way, shown that it's basically good for you and it, it doesn't require any great sacrifices. Glaucon, on the, obvi on the other hand, all about great sacrifices and again, all about excess. So at first he's irritated at the way that, that these citizens uh, limit their, their, their own pleasure, uh, the way that, that, that they never give themselves over to erotic pleasure, to, to, to sexual desire. They're always keeping an eye out, oh, is this, do we have too much of a population now? Could this maybe lead to war? We definitely don't want war. So none of the things that actually you know, really animate Glaucon uh, are actually present in this city. In fact, they're, they're doing everything to keep them out, to, to, to keep them at least under control. And Glaucon can't stand that. He interrupts, again, Glaucon, uh, represents uh, you could, uh, certain types of people or just certain things within almost all human beings, but, but that, that show that that type of city, that type of city that is you know, perfectly rationally organized, uh, that, that, that is perfectly cooperative in which you know, it, there's just perfect harmony, that kind of city, what makes it impossible is people like Glaucon, or again, the, the things that Glaucon represents that are present in, in pretty much all human beings, this, this, this desire for more, this, this desire for luxury, this sort of, again, it's not presented in, in a particularly flattering or, or, or admiring light, it's just Glaucon just wants more, and, and whatever, he's sort of fumbling around, I want relishes, I want a couch, and then just everything, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things, which again, are not presented as, well, you know, Socrates as a philosopher may say, well, I would rather li live in the feverish city, because there's a, there's a very definite limit to how much you could ever know or learn, there, there, there's not really much of a place for philosophy in this first city, uh, but but Socrates doesn't focus on that on that here. He just focuses on the the, the desire for for luxury for for excess of, of one sort or another. And Glaucon sort of you know, eats that all up and keeps going. And then of course also Socrates this will mean war then. And again Glaucon is perfectly happy with that. He he embraces that. And so again the 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 kind of the larger significance of this of this. Uh, this, this section of the text, what is going on, what does this kind of indicate? Again, it, it indicates about uh, politics, about human nature, that, that this first type of city, though it has obvious virtues, though it has obvious uh, good things uh, in its favor, it, it's not possible for, for human beings because, again, it, it just doesn't satisfy all the things that human beings want uh, or need, and these things are represented by Glaucon. 